My name is Karen. I'm spokesperson for Wing Riders. I'll get Paul today from um, Cardano with Paul, YouTube channel, obviously, lots of good, great information and news views and various other things on Cardano. He's obviously co-hosting today and he'll be asking most of the questions because I'll obviously be kind of answering from Wing Riders. We have also going in order Indigo here. So welcome here, Anita BTC and of course Sunday Swap. So yeah, without further to do, um, Paul, um, do you do you want, do you want to get us started um, with some housekeeping, perhaps? Um, just one thing I will add. So the format overall will be um, introduction of different projects. Then we'll move into the sort of um, that DAO section, which will be a discussion. Paul will elaborate on that, and he'll be asking the questions around that. And then we move to a final segment, which is the audience um, AMA. So without further ado, Paul, please. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this as well. DAOs are becoming a more popular topic all the time. So um, it's great to have projects on Cardano already implementing versions of DAOs and be good to hear how each of them are doing it. So I think you've covered most of the housekeeping on timeline and audience questions towards the end as well. So just anyone who wants to help put this out there, please do give the space a share to try and bring more people in to get them involved and get more questions in as well. So we'll kick off anyway and get the projects to start just introducing themselves. Um, we'll start when I'm looking at the space on mine. Anita BTC is coming up beside me. So if we start with you guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for organizing this. Wing Riders, Paul, uh, and all the other teams here. Uh, Another BTC is a, a decentralized on-chain Bitcoin wrapping protocol uh, on Cardano and Ergo. Uh, so basically, what you'll be able to do on our platform uh, is Bitcoin holders will be able to lock up their Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network and then uh, mint an equivalent amount of CBTC or EBTC tokens uh, if you're using Cardano and Ergo. Uh, and then you can then use that Bitcoin uh, freely on a on the Cardano and Ergo chain, uh, such as uh, decentralized exchange, such as Sunday Swap, for example, uh, or maybe even a lender, lending and borrowing platform. Great, thanks for that. And uh, next beside that is Indigo. Hey guys, welcome to be here. So Indigo Protocol is a decentralized uh, synthetic asset protocol building building on Cardano. Uh, what that means is users can use ADA as collateral to mint iAssets. iAssets um, really bridge uh, the decentralized world to the real world uh, in the sense that you can mint iAssets, synthetic assets of any real world asset or digital asset. So such as IBTC, for example, uh, to represent Bitcoin. So giving users price exposure to uh, these digital and real world assets. Um, from there, there's a wide range of utility that iAssets have, whether in Indigo or in the rest of the DeFi landscape. Um, so yeah, that's a that's Indigo uh, from a synthetic asset standpoint. Um, yeah. Great, thanks for that, Eric. Uh, next up, we go with Sunday Swap. Hi, hi. Um, thanks, Paul and Wing Riders for hosting this. Uh, I'm Pi from Sunday Swap. Sunday Swap is a decentralized exchange launched on Cardano. Um, but we are also building out a number of kind of important um, ecosystem tools that we plan to offer. Um, and so as relevant to this talk, um, we've built out a kind of platform as a service layer two governance solution that um, that we're offering. We signed with Endmaker and um, the Jail Cartel from the Disco Solaris project, um, as well as we're supporting voting for the Cardano Foundation's uh, votes for speakers for the Cardano Summit. I'm so excited about to talk specifically about our governance solution here today. Great. And Wing Riders? Yeah, we're Wing Riders. So we're essentially a non custodial, trustless peer to peer um, DEX uh, built on Cardano. Um, we, we're kind of a, like a DeFi platform whereby you can do various things like swapping and um, adding liquidity to pools and double yield farming. So we've got farms like Charlie through, um, yeah, Charlie three, um, and, uh, drip drops and various other ones so that you can do double yield farming. So that's what we do. And we aim to be a sort of infrastructure pills for the whole of the Cardano ecosystem. So we hope to be integrated in various uh, wallets and dApps and various other good things and becoming a DeFi hub. Um, that's the goal. And obviously becoming decentralized on the DAO. So hence tonight. Great, thanks for that. Um, I suppose we go into then, before we get into 
the advantages and stuff like that. But why would why would a project actually use a DAO rather than just I suppose being a centralized entity like we've seen down through the years? Why would someone opt for a DAO when managing Web three projects? I leave that open to any project that wants to take that one. So obviously, um, you know, Bitcoin started this big trend where it got people thinking about. Uh, who was in control of different things, right? And it started us thinking about decentralization. And I think um, it's a very nuanced topic that a lot of people, uh, you know, have various levels of understanding for. But for me, it really boils down to um, uh, two main pillars um, that I want to talk about today anyway. One is the technical decentralization. So, you know, if there's an outage um, in a particular software component, who does that impact, right? In a centralized service, you know, you can build up redundancy and uh, things like that, but um, uh, a, a big outage will bring down all of Facebook, for example, um, or all of AWS will be unavailable. And so decentralized technology like Cardano and Bitcoin and Ethereum focuses on technically how do we... Um, limit the blast radius of something going wrong. And so a DAO is how do we take those same ideas and apply them to like decision-making power structures, right? If something goes wrong in the decision-making process, how do we limit the blast radius of that? How do we include kind of a community of people uh, in making those decisions so that, uh, you know, we can realize maybe the um, the promises of democracy in a kind of technical landscape and um, uh, and really innovate on kind of the organizational structures of um, of our society that's that's what it's all about to me for a doubt okay thanks uh, anyone else want to chime in on that as well kind of talking about the advantages or disadvantages of a DAO? Um, to a community or even in general for a project? Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, so from Indigo side, you know, a DAO is absolutely critical. So we are attempting to equalize the playing field. We want to bring all these financial opportunities to everybody. And the way we do that is through decentralization. We are building this protocol and releasing it out into the world and having it completely community managed. And this is a very powerful concept because it brings those opportunities into like the users of the platform. And so you can think of you know this new DAO type of system as a modern software license where you're issuing these tokens that can then be utilized within these protocols. And then this also gives you ownership. So you know, if you think of the traditional software license such as by issued by Microsoft, where you buy the software and then that profit goes to that corporation and then gets distributed to the shareholders. With a DAO, you get to buy rights to use the protocol to you know, use this new type of innovative software. And then you also get to take a part in the voting and you also get to um, get a share of the profit. So in Indigo's case, when users use the protocol, there will be a collection of fees and then those fees go directly to the indie stakeholders. Um, and this is, has so many benefits. And then you get into the democratization, like Pi was saying, where any user can just introduce a new synthetic asset. And as long as everybody democratically agrees, then that can go live without any of the middle middlemen and like without all the burdensomes, like we can just create these new innovative products in a much more efficient manner. Yeah. I mean, that, that's really well said. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, mo- a lot of the points have been kind of raised by a lot of projects. So we're talking about lack of reliance, obviously, on a centralized authority, which these hierarchies might have their own interest at heart and really not the interest of the members or shareholders or how you like to think of it, obviously. And that that is a big part of it. And when you look at 
I mean, when you look at DAOs, I think, and this has been kind of the big Web3 ecosystem development of now, you look at the main tenants, which are decentralization, which is a big thing, accessibility, so openness to everyone to participate rather than a closed system whereby, you know, people are excluded because of their ratings or um, past information, which really has no bearing on the future or current status of someone. And obviously security, because it's all um, based on blockchain technology. I think those are definitely some of the great things that comes with the creation of a decentralized autonomous organization of one sort or another. I mean, I think a, a lot of um, times they talk about the principal agent dilemma, whereby obviously um, a person or group has their interests at heart who are at the top of this hierarchy and the rest, um, they, they make decisions for the rest of the people who are actually probably contributing in some kind of financial or uh, another way. So those are some um, areas and i think um pi wants to add to that so I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet and let pi take over yeah just to extend uh expand on what uh, indigo and wing writers were saying um, i think a great example of that is if you look at the business life cycle for um, a lot of industries in our economy today it tends to be let's bring in a lot of users with like a really great product something that's free you know provide a lot of advantages. Um, for example, you know, Facebook is a free product that you can sign up for, or banks will offer, you know, great interest rates and, um, you know, no fees, or Netflix will start out with really cheap streaming services. But as they solidify their power, they um, start becoming exploitive, right? And so this is another advantage of a DAO of, you um, uh, avoiding that exploitation by making those decisions, uh, by putting those decisions in the hands of the users that would otherwise be uh, being exploited. So for example, you know, over time, the bank will start charging you overdraft fees or ATM fees, um, where as a new business, they didn't, they couldn't do that because they didn't have the leverage over you as a user. But as they kind of established their near monopoly, they kind of uh, achieved a leverage over their users that is unhealthy and in a lot of cases unethical. Or you'll see, um, you know, Netflix now, uh, once they garnered huge market share, they started to crank up their prices. Or um, now, you know, there's the news breaking that they're going to start instituting ads, right? Um, and so I think a lot of these, uh, when you put a single governing body in place and you uh, separate a user's agency um, from the decision-making capability, you get these exploitive structures that, you know, the, the average end user, you might say, oh, well, just don't use that service. Um, the, the problem is the centralization of the power and the kind of market share. Oftentimes you don't have other choices or the other choices kind of are vastly inferior because these organizations have kind of uh, anchored their control. So um, I think that's a really great kind of concrete example of how I think about these exploitive structures being kind of what we're trying to eliminate with DAOs to, that um, kind of Indian wing writers were referring to. All right. Thanks, Pai. Um, yeah, we have drip drops in now as well. So drip drops, if I'm not sure who's on the account at the minute, but if you want to give an introduction to your project and then we'll go into a discussion on or each project. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having us on. Um, this is Anthony on the Drip Drops account today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so for those of you that don't know our platform, we are a token distribution uh, platform for Cardano native assets essentially projects can come to us and, and launch uh, their token off of our platform based on the parameters that they specify. So whether that be staking to a certain pool or um, holding a certain NFT, we can, we can pretty much filter out the wallets that need to receive certain tokens and then display them uh, for uh, availability for the user. Um, from a user standpoint, users can select the tokens that they want kind of like um a selective or an anti-spam drop and um, they just do a withdrawal on drip drops and they're dropped right into their wallet. So from a high level, <clears throat> that's essentially what we do. 
Uh, we have hosted a vote on our platform before, and it was to help uh, decide which parameters the platform would be ran by. And some there was a few tokenomics questions in there as well. Um, and the vote was all on chain. It, it worked very, very well. So as of most recently, we were um, asked by uh, Catalyst Circle to help conduct the vote for uh, Catalyst Circle members. And we're actually working on the UI UX for that today. Nice. So with your own platform at the minute, um, is, there, is there an active DAO there for people to submit proposals or that's, that's still in the works? Um, not yet. That's been something that we've been considering. It's, we call it the petition or to raise a petition. Um, so it would be the idea of, of hosting a vote. Uh, a petition would run first, but yeah, that's something we are considering. Okay, nice. Um, we'll go around some of the other projects. Thanks, Anthony, and Thank hear you. what process they have. I think Anita BTC, haven't heard from you in a while. Do you want to kick off about what, if you guys have a demo in place and how, how the voting and stuff like that works? I wouldn't say it's, it's currently fully a DAO. Uh, definitely that is like the, the direction that we're headed and we just had our first governance vote, but, uh, I mean, yeah, definitely to a certain extent, like a lot of, uh, a lot of points in the process are still centralized. Uh, but you know, through one, uh, developing internally, but then also like working with some of the outside infrastructure, uh, in the ecosystem, uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunities to, to become fully decentralized. Uh, like for example, the first vote we used uh, Voter, uh, and that was a really cool platform to use. And I know uh, some other projects are developing different DAO infrastructure. I, I think Sunday Swap is, is doing something similar. Uh, so it's really exciting that there's a lot of uh, infrastructure and support going into this and making it as decentralized as possible. Uh, but for us, uh, it's a bit different too because uh, not only are we on Cardano, but we're also on Ergo. So uh, a fun part of, of the journey is figuring out how to, you know, branch those two ecosystems as much as possible and have a, a full governance ecosystem that, that works across both chains. So that's that's what we're working towards right now. Nice. Yeah, I suppose that can be complex to try and accommodate both chains as well. But um, maybe that's something we can get into another time about your project. Um, Eric, I see you have your hand up there. I know you have voting ongoing at the minute. So do you want to talk a bit about your DAO and the process and where you guys are going as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, to your point, we absolutely do have a DAO in place right now. Uh, seeing as how Indigo V1 is not launched yet, um, our DAO and participation really is uh, through our off-chain form. Um, that's still an important and key component to the future of the Indigo DAO, which will be fully decentralized on chain. Um, however, right now we're, we're leveraging the forum uh, to kind of build this, this to what Robert said earlier, this community owned uh, spirit around Indigo protocol. So we're halfway through um, what we have called the Indigo DAO kickstart. And this is really a campaign to, to, to recruit the community to um, engage them, the current followers, the Indigo DAO, uh, to ratify the Indigo DAO constitution, which is a critical component to this whole governance structure, right? Um, without a proper constitution, this, this foundation, this guidelines of what the Indigo DAO or any other DAO can do, um, it, it's, it, it's going to be a, a swing and a miss. <laughs> so uh, this, this constitution is really the guidelines for how the Indigo DAO will operate in the future and what authority uh, they have. So that was our first phase three weeks ago. Uh, it's a five-week phase, this kickstart phase. Um, and last week, we were presenting the Indigo Foundation so as to represent the Indigo DAO in the real world. So the Indigo DAO will not be a naked DAO. It will have a legal entity representing uh, it and working on the behalf of the Indigo DAO for off-chain agreements that might need to be structured. And just, again, that legal entity representation of the Indigo DAO in the real world. Uh, and this week, we have presented the Indigo DAO voting procedures, which are aligned with the Indigo Constitution. So, um, you know, all of this is really, like I said, to kickstart that Indigo DAO, this community ownership concept of the Indigo Protocol. Um, we'll have two more phases of the kickstart campaign. Uh, one next week where the users will be presented, uh, the DAO members rather, will be presented 
uh, what I assets the Indigo protocol intends to launch with. Um, I think one uh, that's probably the most important I asset now, as some of our colleagues and friends here listening probably know, is we've announced that we're going to be bringing a stablecoin solution to the Cardano ecosystem. Um, so that's uh, IUSD. That is a very critical uh, need for the entire ecosystem. Um, so we, re we, we recognize that. So we need the community to really govern that into existence and say, okay, yes, we, we want to do this. So uh, we're really giving the Indigo DAO members full say, even if off chain for now, it still will be an eventual uh, on chain vote that's presented as the first vote. So um, at the fifth and final phase of this Indigo DAO kickstart campaign, we will roll all the prior four proposals up and present this launch proposal uh, in the off-chain forum, have it all ratified to essentially, uh, it, it, it's a decentralized community-led decision to even launch Indigo protocol. Uh, so once that's done, we will go align with mainnet uh, next month. We will be issuing this first protocol, uh, this first proposal uh, on-chain. So our on-chain governance is completely decentralized. Robert had made a note uh, earlier that this is community owned. It truly is. Uh, so the governance process will still include the off-chain forum as we have a temp check process, which is really more, more around discussion um, and, and hearing the community thoughts around whitelisting new assets, I assets, or delisting them, just really an off-chain discussion forum. But that will eventually lead to a poll once that poll is approved, you can take, uh, basically it opens up the ability in the Indigo web app, which cross-references that approved poll from the forum. And then that voting process will happen through the Indigo web app and on chain. So that all happens day one uh, at launch. We have some other features that I'd like to talk about, but I want to get some other members here, uh, some, some floor room. But if we have time, I'd love to get into uh, um, our adaptive quorum biasing feature that we've built as well on chain. Nice. Um, yeah, the, I'm definitely looking forward to you guys bringing um, stablecoins or iAsset version of stablecoins to Cardano. Yep. It's definitely something the chain needs going forward. Um, and yeah, we'll come back to some more around your processes for voting and how you will do that. Uh, we'll go around to the table. I see Pai has his hand up as well here. I know you guys had your governance on Testnet there two, three weeks ago now. So I'll let you get into that. Yeah, um, and actually this dovetails really well into what Eric was saying. Um, the, uh, when we think about governance, kind of we sat down and we, we put a lot of thought into what does it mean to govern a protocol? And we saw it breaking down in three kind of main activities or three main uh, themes. First, there is the refinement uh, of a proposal, right? Um, so that is... Uh, it's really critical for the healthy governance of a system to um, have the ability to, you know, create garbage proposals that then get refined through discussion and and uh, and analysis. Right? Um, somebody does economic simulations to break down what different parameters would uh, kind of result in. Somebody uh, proposes alternatives and kind of really that pressure testing. Um, uh, to get to kind of a final proposal that's worth occupying people's time. Uh, because that's the, the second key component is the decision. How do you make sure you reach a representative decision of what your community wants? And it's kind of an inconvenient process to, you know, get your users to go out of their way to read and understand a proposal and to vote on it, um, because you know that takes a lot of effort to really understand deeply a specific proposal. Um, so that refinement process is key to making sure that, like, when we ask for the end user's time, uh, it's um, we're using that time well. And then the final stage of uh, a healthy governance is the execution. How do you? Um, how do you take that decision that you've reached and actually carry out the results? Um, and there's a number of different ways to implement each of these. Um, what we're focusing on right now is that second uh, tier, the, the decision layer. And so what we've built is um, a fully off-chain layer two governance solution. 
um, that, you know, you can, I would suggest you go to YouTube and look up Nerd Out. With, uh, I did a sit down with Andrew Westberg to go through the technical details of how we achieved this. But what our solution really allows is um, voting in a way that's transparent and uh, cryptographically secured, but which doesn't incur a fee to the end user. Um, which is really important because for kind of metadata based voting, um, you know, that is a 0.18 fee roughly for every vote. And that's a small deterrent to participation. Um, and if, you know, you have a smart contract involved in that, you know, that could be one, two ADA per vote um, in some cases. So uh, it's really important uh, for us to have that um, uh, solution, which encourages user participation, uh, doesn't clog the chain with every vote, just with kind of the, the, the roll up and the commitment to the results of that vote, but in a way that still makes sure that you're capturing the uh, a fair and honest representation of what your community wants. So that's the solution that we've been building. And it turns out it's pretty hard. And so what we did is we said, wouldn't it be great if other projects in the Cardano community didn't have to go through all of this effort to uh, you know, achieve the same thing. And so we're offering that as a platform, as a service. If you're a project that feels like you want governance, but you don't you don't need the on-chain execution element. You're really just trying to connect with your community um, and you don't want to build it yourself. Feel free to reach out to us at contact at sundayswap.finance. Uh, but so that's really kind of the, the niche that we're carving out for ourselves. And I'll also say here, I'm super excited that there's lots of uh, options for Cardano projects. So I, I see uh, earlier, I saw Voter in the audience. I'm you know, what they've built is super cool. So I'm super excited that there's a diversity of options. Indigo is using, um, I believe the, uh, or no, they built their own stuff, but Liquid is building um, Agora, which is an on-chain voting execution framework. So I think that the future of governance on Cardano is particularly exciting because we're seeing so much choice and options um, among different projects. Thanks, Pai. Um, yeah, I think there, it's great to see different solutions out there and see how different projects are approaching it. And sometimes, like, you built the solution that others can use. It's good to have that service out there for people who don't want to go and build it themselves. They want to work on the rest of their product. I see we have people requested to speak as well. Um, we'll stick to the schedule the cream set at the beginning and have questions at the end, but I'll stick to the line in which people requested when we get there. Uh, just on your one pie as well, I think that it's going to be interesting to see how can projects encourage people to actually get involved in voting because I seen when the Cardano Summit uh, speaker one went up, some of the first things that people said is, I'd, I don't want to pay a fee. Now, you don't actually have to pay a fee for that, but that's going to be the initial thing from people is, what do I get for voting? So that's something that projects will have to try and get around as well as how do they encourage or sometimes incentivize users to vote. But we might come back to that in a few minutes. Wing Riders, we haven't heard from you guys on your... When we um, started looking at the government's sort of solutions, we were guided really by two principles, openness and transparency. And it's interesting listening to um, every project. Everyone's kind of got their own slant on it. But openness and transparency was at the heart of sort of our governance um, mechanism when we started to build it out. And at the moment, it's live and um, the first votes are being cast as we speak. So, um, yeah, if you head over to the governance section on the Wing Riders app, you can see it. It's um, a fairly clean interface and you can see how it works. So the aim is really by using those two principles to minimize the technological barrier um, and allow, allow you know, members uh, from any background to easily contribute. So the same applies for the voting as well, make it as simple and um, you know, so everyone understands really the flow. Uh, most of the current solutions that we've kind of listened to are, is a mix of on-chain transactions and some off-chain parts as well that are included on websites or traditional databases. And when you look at a kind of government, governance mechanism, you've got 
fairly basic bits. You've got the proposal section, you've got the voting section, and then you've got the counting section. So our proposal section, if we start off from there, really is about putting out sort of questions for a vote and uh, that could be decided by um, the members. So uh, members really, uh, while a proposal out there, we like the um, idea of having a discussion. So we've got an improvements platform at community.wingriders.com where um, we suggest obviously having an open discussion to refine and make those proposals as, um, if you like, refined and as complete and can just support obviously for them um, in terms of the community as a whole. Um, we saw mostly um, the information for the proposal start, to be honest, start, um, stored off chain, um, presented kind of on websites and forums. So we thought really the best way for to store a binding solution would be on chain and as part of really the transaction metadata. So since proposals could be very detailed to minimize the data on chain, we decided to go with, in the end, um, the IPFS system, which is the interplanetary file system, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network for storing and like, sharing data. So it's very distributed and um, it's, it's a very good system to use. It's up there. And that seemed like the best solution really for us to go because it can't be manipulated. Everyone can see it, uh, the proposal itself. So that's really what we went for. This way, um, it's very clear to everyone that um, no one controls it, no team, no other entity but the proposer. And you can always see the creator of a proposal within our dashboard, within our, our governance dashboard. By clicking onto it, you can clearly see who it was. You can see their proposal um, with the IPFS file there. So that's that's that section the voting section obviously is the second most important part we again apply the transparency um sort of ethos onto there and um, you know how, how can you verify you know who created the proposal and you know how easy is it to verify what individual writers like you know actually voted on it who voted so when a proposal was thoroughly discussed um it would be the members um turn to really cast their votes right so this is where most of the solutions started for us to differ out there and um, they became quite you know unique in their own so our system doesn't really require any um, you know voter tokens to be locked in any way so that I suppose reduces the barrier to entry to voting even though obviously you know someone who holds the tokens of a project wants to be involved there they're not always that it's not always like that but you want to lower the barriers as much as you can so we wanted to have a governance solution where um, WRT holders our um, governance token holders um, could keep their, um, if you like, WRTs or governance tokens in farms, in liquidity pools, in the boosting vault, wherever it is. But they could still, um, you know, those those tokens would all count in terms of their voting power. So we thought that's really important not to have them locked because you could have, you know, certain tokens locked in other protocols or doing other things and then you've only got a certain allocation and that would then be locked again. So we went totally um, towards like any governance tokens that you have in any uh, of our ecosystem, anywhere in our ecosystem would be used for that contribution. So transparency of both proposal submission, voting and voting power, hopefully it's uh, uh, a little bit clearer. In terms of costs, yeah, um, I th we, don't, we think it's fairly reasonable. There's just one transaction cost, um, which whatever it is, it's a fifth of an ADA or 20th of ADA depending. So it's not that costly. So the gain, hopefully the barriers are very low. And finally, the last stage is really the counting and if you like the auditing after the voting period ends for proposal obviously the votes need to be counted and verified right so there's different solutions again out there that we looked at and we got the inspiration from some and we thought others wouldn't work for us so for counting the votes really following our again transparency principles giving the option for anybody to verify so anyone really can go on the blockchain and check what happened on the results or in the obviously governance um dashboard they can um, put the links in and really go there and check it out for themselves we thought that's probably the most again transparent way to do this where by again it's not in a, some server or some database you know owned by the project rather it's again on chain everything can be verified so if the all the all the data is um, available on chain 
anybody can view this data, right? So <laughs> pretty simple. To ease, like, the obviously adoption and improve the transparency, we've also decided to open source um, our solution for collecting and verifying these votes. And we're going to be releasing that fairly soon. So, yeah, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. You know, we, we've tried to keep um, as much of it as we can, and we hope to have most of all of this is... Um, you know, kind of open to uh, everyone to have a look at. So please head down um, by, by get some WRT if you already haven't got it and start voting. Thanks, Karim. Um, Anthony, we we'll go back to you if you have anything to add from the drip drop side. Yeah, I mean, I think the general consensus here is, you know, everyone's trying to build the voting platforms that <clears throat> foster transparency and fairness uh, within the vote, that was when we when we hosted our first vote. You know, our our main concerns were transparency, and um, <clears throat> one of the other main concerns was um, the spoofing of an address or creating a Franken address and then voting with someone else's. So we we found a fix to that. So yeah, I mean that's the same consensus as everyone else is transparency and fairness in in the voting mechanisms. Okay, nice, nice for that. I see Eric. You we'll go back to you now to add in what you want, and then we'll kind of get some final thoughts from everyone and see what questions are out there from people listening. Anyone that wants to ask questions, you can start requesting speaker, and we'll bring them up when the projects are finished here. Um, so a moment ago, I was just kind of explaining where we're currently at with the Indigo DAO in this off-chain capability sense, but the importance that it will play in the future on-chain capability. You know, we've built a really robust on-chain governance system um, that will still tie into the off-chain governance form for discussion and ensuring that these approved polls that will eventually be on-chain proposals all check out. So um, Robert here has been pretty key in helping uh, guide Indigo from an on-chain standpoint as to how we wanted to build the system, what we wanted to include, such as what I hinted to earlier with adaptive quorum biasing. So I did want to take just a few minutes so that we can kind of dig in a little bit further into the Indigo on-chain governance system itself and hand it over to Robert so he can give you some of the details. Yeah, thanks, Eric. So yeah, we kind of have broken down our governments into two like sections where you have like the off-chain component and the on-chain component. And the on-chain component is dependent on the off-chain. Um, to kind of bridge that gap, we introduce moderators. So I'll get into that in a second. But like the first phase is what we call the temperature check which is all of the discussion in the Indigo governance forum. So here is where members will come and propose an idea and then the community members will um, make add feedback and refine it and then go to vote. So this will be like an informal vote just to kind of get a feel for whether or not it's going to pass the official on-chain vote. Once that stage is finished, then you bring it into the on-chain uh, proposal. And so this is where we um, have the concept of the moderator. So the DAO moderator are elected by the members. So that itself is a proposal. So they are elected to kind of aid that process to, they don't have like control over the protocol, but they uh, abide by the constitution and they help the just do the off-chain kind of uh, administrative tasks, such as make, making sure that everything follows the procedures and that um, if all the proposals on chain are matching the constitution. And so when that proposal is created on chain, then the members of the DAO, and you become a member by staking your Indy token, you then vote yes or no. And we encourage participation um, by rewarding our users through uh, Indie rewards. So there, there's two benefits of staking Indie in the protocol. That first benefit is gaining the right to vote. And the second is to um, get protocol fees. So whenever fees are generated, you get a portion of those fees. Now we get a, a third uh, kind of reward where if you participate in the voting um, and you don't have to have a lot of participation, but just some sort of participation, then the protocol will reward you with additional bonus indie. So by 
staking in the protocol and participating, you not only get the protocol fees, you also get the, some indie rewards as like a thank you for voting. So when the users go to vote, um, we have what's called adaptive quorum biasing. And what this does is it um, adjusts the quorum threshold. So the quorum threshold is how many yes votes compared to no votes are required in order to pass a proposal. So the more participation, like the lower that threshold gets, and then the less participation, the higher that threshold gets. So what that means is that if there's like a small amount of participation, so like only 2% of voters are voting, then of those 2%, you have to have over 80% yes vote. Now, as more people participate, that threshold goes lower. So if you get 50% of people voting, then you have to get over 50% of those saying yes. And so this kind of um, allows us to dynamically set that threshold based on the perceived importance. So the more important a vote is, the more likely it is to have higher participation. Now, if a lot of people don't want to participate, um, then that's still okay because the system allows for that by just increasing that threshold so that the people who are participating, they all have to unanimously agree that yes, we want that change. So we really have taken the time to kind of think about human behavior and how people are going to actually be using the protocol to kind of de decentralize and democratize how um, all on-chain governance works. And the other important aspect is that absolutely everything that any change in the protocol has to go through the governance. And so that includes the upgrade. So we have seven different proposal types. And one of those proposal types is actually the ability to upgrade the protocol. So when we go to release version two of Indigo, there's no centralized process for that. No, none of the team members you know, the foundation, no one has keys to the protocol because it's completely owned by the IndigoDAO members. And to upgrade, we have to you know, write the code, submit it to the DAO to review. Um, we'll attach an audit report to that. And then the DAO will vote yes or no, like we want this new code to be deployed. And if they approve, then that gets automatically executed and the protocol undergoes that automatic upgrade. So that's just kind of a high level view. I don't want to like take too much time, but I think the best way to learn about like the, how we tackle our DAO structure is really just to go to our governance forum and start participating in the votes and read the constitution, um, read the foundation documents and read the voting procedures and just get involved. Thanks Robert, um, yeah. Great points there as well. And I like that you're thinking of the psychology behind it as well. I think that you can build the best voting platforms and the best processes in the world. But if you can't get your user base involved, then the actual system you've built isn't much good. So it's good to see or good to hear that you're looking at that side as well, because especially during the current market conditions, you need to be able to really get people engaged and see what you can do to get them engaged. So uh, has anyone any final thoughts or will we go over to the questions? I see we have four people have, I see tech writer. Yeah, sorry, Kim. I, I think, yeah, sorry. I was just, um, uh, I was just told um, by actually tech writer that our governance audit tool has just gone live a few hours ago, by the way. So it's all open source and it's on GitHub and the announcements and everything's out. So I, just, <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, as I said, it was going to be released, but it's already released Great. a few hours ago. So that's all I wanted to say really, but yeah, handing over to you. <laughs> Great, and uh, congrats on getting getting that up live now. So first up on the requests that I see here, I see I'll take them in order that they are. Clarity Protocol is the first one that's coming up. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the space. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate all the conversation. My name's Logan. I'm one of the the core team members on uh, that's building Clarity. So we're we are extending Agora. Um, that Liquid is building to build kind of a no-code, all-on-chain DAO infrastructure. Um, you, uh, the big thing, I guess, coming up is we're going to be launching our beta version with uh, Genius DAO. Um, there'll be kind of a closed beta testing out the infrastructure before we launch V1. Um, 
right now we have a doubt pitch competition going on. See our Twitter, but that's not really why I wanted to chat. Um, I wanted to come all the way back to kind of the first question that was posed because I thought it was a, a really good one, the advantages and, and disadvantages of, of operating as a DAO. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's a lot of advantages you can think of. You can think of social advantages. You can think of just like everyone can use it, the access, all those things that, that are good for businesses um, and why it might be advantageous. But what we really need to think about it is why is operating as a DAO advantageous for the world? And how is operating as a DAO advantageous for the regulators? Um, And I have ideas about this. And, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is for the first time ever, there's no need to officially register through a centralized entity service. There's, there's no need to open an LLC or a C Corp and go through there. And that's kind of scary for the regulators, you might say. But the thing is, when you open a DAO, it's, it's instant access to forensic accounting on the blockchain, like making every action that impacts funds or, or running a service fully auditable. Um, and I think that's very powerful in the a- advantages of, of operating a DAO from the government's perspective. Um, and I think a big thing that goes along with that is kind of setting standards in the space. Um, and so when we have all these awesome new innovative companies operating as DAOs on Cardano, how are they gonna be regulated? How is this gonna be an ecosystem that can continue to uh, thrive? Um, and the, the last thing I wanna touch on is just on-chain infrastructure is great. Off-chain voting infrastructure is great. Um, and there's going to be a lot of different projects for a lot of different use cases. You don't want to decide, you know, what color you're going to make your Twitter banner on an on-chain vote. Um, but that's something that the community may really care about. Um, just throwing thoughts around at this point, but appreciate the conversation. Hey, thanks for coming up and thanks for all the points. Yeah, we had Eclipse. Hello, guys. I have a simple question regarding DAOs. Uh, mainly in DEXs. So my question is, what is the point of having DAO if you don't have uh, full information about your revenue disclosed? For example, I was uh, looking uh, in the DEXs uh, if they have smart contract where, where, they, where they show revenues from the platform like fees. And I don't think any DEXs show this info. So if governors don't don't have the info, what is the point of them in voting about something if they don't have info? For example, I might have a, I might make a proposal in DAO to increase the platform fees, but those governors they don't know how much revenue does uh, fee uh, make and what's the point of it at all? I would say that in the case of a DEX, all of that information is available on chain. So for example. With Sunday Swap, all of that information is in every transaction. Um, so how much fee is collected and where it gets distributed to. Um, in our case, Sunday Swap doesn't make any revenue from that. Uh, the protocol makes some amount of revenue and pays it to the scoopers. And um, uh, I think maybe more to your point, uh, there's not an aggregation of that data, right? So somebody has to scan through all of the swaps that have ever been done on the DEX to kind of aggregate that in the a way that's meaningful. And I think that's where the first phase of governance, as we think about it, the refinement really comes in, right? You make a proposal, uh, I think fees should be lower, right? But that's meaningless without the, the research to back up how much lower can the, can the protocol still operate, uh, et cetera. Um, I also think that it's important to make the distinction between governing a protocol like the Sunday Swap protocol and a company, right? Like the Sunday Swap Labs software development company. Um, as we envision it, uh, the Sunday voting token can't make decisions about kind of Sunday Swap Labs. Uh, you know, you can't propose a vote to say we should fire this engineer or whatever, right? That's a, a decisions that are being made within the Sunday Swap. Um, team, but the protocol is something that we built and and kind of set off into the world, and now it exists, and it really isn't ours. We're the most knowledgeable about it, and we, for now, maintain the the first um, kind of on-ramp or portal into interfacing with that, that protocol, but there are already many people who are building and interacting with that protocol completely independent of us. So MuesliSwap, for example, builds 
their own swap transactions to submit to the protocol, right? And so that the governance of that protocol um, that is shared by everybody is separate from kind of the operation of one specific company. Um, so, and you have your hand raised. So did you have a follow-up that uh, you wanted to? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, Wing Riders, I wanted to reference them because I was actually checking uh, on them a while ago and they have a smart contract uh, where everything is in it, like liquidities and fees, and you cannot, you cannot, uh, uh, users cannot differentiate easily which are the platform fees because they actually have those uh, and they go to treasury, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so in case of wing riders, it's uh, it's very hard to distinguish for the users, and you have to uh, take into the consideration that regular users they are not good at looking uh, for info. I recently I, I came across people asking how many tokens are in in one project having the policy ID which they can check easily you know yeah um, great Eclipse I can answer those questions so on our platform actually we clearly show the fees for each pool for the past 24 hours and seven days so the fee breakdown is 0.35 percent and 0.3 goes back obviously to the liquidity providers in that pool and another 0.05 goes to the protocol and that goes to a treasury that's never been touched so that that's very clearly actually indicated on the platform itself and uh, next up we have riley thanks paul I just wanted to come up and say a couple of things because I think governance is at the top of many people's minds. You know, off-chain voting is is really great, uh, like Logan mentioned before, uh, for things like deciding on your Twitter banner color. Uh, but I think that when it comes to protocol governance, it's of the utmost importance to manage things through true governance on-chain via smart contracts. Uh, and and I, I think that I wanted to come up here and kind of voice my concerns around uh, the the lack of seriousness taken around it uh, by many protocols, or at least it seems to be that way. I, I wanted to, to make sure that it's kind of clear that I, I think if Cardano uh, as a layer one, for example, with regards to its protocol parameters, does not end up decentralized uh, sooner rather than later, people will try and make an alternative. I believe that if the current AMM DEXs on Cardano do not choose to have on-chain governance, alternatives will be provided because it's not all that hard to use Agora to create an AMM that is governed by Agora. Um, I, I think that I, I wanted to really applaud uh, Indigo uh, and Liquid and and. Additionally, I, I had a question for Indigo because I think it matters quite a lot around the uh, sort of DAO moderators. And the question that I had is whether or not um, there are multiple moderators, whether or not a moderator is actually required in order to instantiate a proposal on chain. And uh, if moderators are required and there are not multiple moderators or uh, sort of a a large, large ish list of moderators. Um, is there not a, a high risk that there would be some sort of stalling at some point if moderators did not like what was going on? Again, sort of calling into question the verifiability of not necessarily your, your transparency of voting, but uh, the actual effects that your votes will have. Yeah, I could take that question real quick with regards to Indigo moderator structure. Um, so as Robert had mentioned earlier, moderators are there uh, only to ensure that the proposal flow and process is abiding by the constitutional rules uh, and voting procedures uh, that have been ratified by the Indigo DAO. Uh, moderators, we will have multiple of them, all of which will have varying term limits, uh, ranging from three, six, nine, and 12 months, uh, all of which are elected by the DAO. Um, so, yeah, from a moderator standpoint, we, we fully understand uh, that they cannot be some centralized authority over the voting procedures or governance processes, uh, which is why we've uh, decided to go with a multitude of moderators with varying term limits. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that was perfect. I know uh, I saw Pi raise his hand at some point, and if there's sort of feedback, I'd, I'd love a chance to give a, a rebuttal as well. So what's up, Pai? 
Yeah, no, um, I think, you know, I'm fully in agreement with you in that um, kind of on the uh, long tail uh, for the biggest protocols, the on-chain kind of smart contract enforced governance is pretty critical. Um, there's a careful balancing act though, right? Because this ecosystem is so new and because we haven't seen our first major hack yet, right? And so when you codify something in a smart contract, you are fixing in place the, the rules kind of as you see them today um, and the you know, potential flaws in that, right? And so the approach that we're taking at Sunday Swap is that we do fully plan to put any, you know, semi, even semi-critical items under the governance of a smart contract. Things like managing the treasury, protocol upgrades, uh, things like that. Um, the the pro the risk there, though, is that if you do so quickly with something like Agora, that hasn't been battle tested, that hasn't had, you know, it's undergone an audit, but it hasn't gone undergone the you know, so to speak, real world audit of, you know, very, very brilliant hackers trying to uh, exploit it every day for six months to a year um, because of the kind of size of the pot that it represents. Um, there's also the, um, you know, uh, ex the feature set that you have to affix in place for your governance when you launch with Agora, right? So I think that there's uh, a careful balance between um, if you can first achieve decision making in a transparent and high confidence way, then you can transition into um, a smart contract controlled protocol, uh, in, in my opinion, in a safer way than like once you've seen how different voting structures and, and things like that play out in the real world rather than kind of affixing those decisions in the sand and potentially with weaknesses, I'm not saying I know of any weaknesses in Agora or anything like that, but, you know, um, I think everything uh, deserves to be battle tested before being put in such a critical role. Right. So I, I totally agree with you that it's, it's critical. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to explain the kind of timeline and the reasoning there of where I think that in some cases it doesn't necessarily need to be immediate and it doesn't necessarily need to be for every decision. No, but, I, I agree with that as well. I think that with regards to Agora um, and smart contracts in general, you know, like uh, outside of auditing and then, I mean, if you take it a step further and go and do like formal verification, which no one is doing at this point in time, to my knowledge, um, it, you know, you can get, pretty battle tested prior to deployment but deployment is sort of the ultimate battle testing and and i think that at the end of the day someone has to do it and again i i applaud liquid for kind of taking that step forward i applaud indigo as well um i i think that when it comes to uh sort of waiting a little while that makes sense it's very wise especially from a, a legal standpoint i know it was said a, a few minutes ago that um DAOs may sort of mitigate liability or you don't need to register but it's it's definitely i, I mean I'm, I'm not a lawyer i'm not giving legal advice here but uh from what i understand generally if you have a DAO that doesn't have sort of a legal wrapper it can be viewed as a general partnership and that sort of veil can be pierced by legal uh entities regulators and and so i i think that it, it comes down to a sort of situation where you know you said it very well it's a balancing act um and and I, I think that it'll be really interesting to see how you guys proceed. I do hope that uh, as soon as you guys are confident with the security models of either the, the solution that Indigo is putting forward or of uh, Agora that you guys do choose to make that leap. Because, again, I, I do think that sooner or later someone else will. Yeah, that is absolutely kind of our vision for the Sunday Swap Protocol. Um, and it will probably be bootstrapped through... Uh, kind of our transparent and auditable voting that we're building now. So this is just really a step in that process. But thank you for the question. Thanks, Ronnie. Great questions. And I think the whole legal side of DAOs and how projects navigate going forward is definitely a good topic. Maybe we can do 
another space at some stage talking about that because I think that's that's a black hole if we get into it at this point. Um, we still have Tom. Great conversations, great sort of introduction to like how a lot of people are thinking about governance of whether it be the protocol, treasury. Um, but the one thing that like I'm interested in and that I didn't hear touched on very much is like, I know Riley sort of started getting into it a little at the end and Indigo as well has a system they're developing. But the voting, like a couple times I heard like, oh, the last step, which is counting the votes, but really the last step would be the execution of the effects um, to be carried out based on those votes. And I think that's really important. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of mention that and, and see how people are thinking about executing those votes. Cause, uh, I know technically this isn't true, but the way I think, you know, easiest to explain it to people is either like, Hey, you have a smart contract, um, where these effects get issued to with the proposal, <clears throat> they go through this governance process, they end up on chain in a UTXO that can be spent by anyone, right? Um, or then you have like these other systems with like governors or trusted members who have, you know, maybe a multi-sig to where it's, you know, a number of people that have to agree to then spend some kind of transaction or execute something. And then you have, you know, just one person with one public key who will act as like a company or an executive uh, use votes to signal, but then ultimately is up to them to execute. I think we're going to see all three of these systems, and I think they're all three very necessary, but it's also something that we don't touch on, I think, enough um, is, like I said, how those votes um, and the effects, you know, wanted by those votes, how do they get executed? Yeah, that's a really great question, Tom, um, because, yeah, you're right that voting is only one aspect. You actually have to do the implementation. And so the, before I mentioned we had like seven different proposal types. Um, so each proposal type in Indigo has what's called an effect. And then this effect is what is executed by the protocol. Um, so depending on the proposal type, it has a different way of implementing that effect. So in case of a text proposal, um, this is when the DAO members would vote on you know, the constitutional changes, um, voting procedures, you know, some sort of partnership agreement, say I want to have an agreement with this Oracle provider. Um, this is when like, there's no on-chain effect because that's not something that can be codified. But that's why we have the Indigo Foundation who will act on behalf of the intent of the DAO to go and take that text proposal and implement it. Now, in the case of another type of proposal, which is whitelisting an I asset, this is completely codified and automated. So if you want to create a new synthetic asset, say I want to bring a traditional financial asset onto Cardano, you know, you can make that proposal. You just need to have the name, you need to point to the Oracle data feeds. And then if it gets approved, then that effect gets automatically executed by the protocol. So it's no, there's no human interaction. There's you know, in, at Indigo, there's no one with the keys. Um, there's no central authority. Everything is like automatically executed by the protocol. Now there's a little bit of a, a complication when it comes to the upgrading. So you know, the seven type of proposal in Indigo is upgrading the protocol. Now this is a, a two step execution effect where the first step is like changing the hashes of you know, where the smart contracts are being pointed to. So you know, every time Cardano is basically pointing to a hash and um, the second step is the migration, where you know if you have um, a bunch of users that are staking in a stability pool, for example, then they would, and the stability pool has been upgraded from you know, version one to version two. You know, what the protocol has done is it's created a new version of the stability pool. And so then the individual users would then um, kind of run their own migration action to transfer their funds from stability pool A to stability pool B. And so this is where um, you would go in and you were authorized to move funds from you know, A to B, uh, but that's the only action you can do. So that's where the human interaction comes in, um, but it's a very restricted environment where you know, 
you can't do anything outside of the rules defined by the protocol. You know, you can't send those funds to another completely unrelated protocol, another stability pool. You can only send it to where it's defined in the upgrade path. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a great point, Tom. So I, I hope I've kind of added some clarity. Yep. Thank you very much, Robert, for that. Hopefully, uh, Tom, uh, that answers some of your questions. Um, we'll move to our um, next speaker, perhaps our last speaker, Osmium. Yeah, hi, guys. Um, it's nice um, hanging out with y'all. Uh, and, um, you know, at Osmium, we are exposed to use to build, you know, our, our governance structure. And, um, you know, hopping on this call is a great exploration for we in Osmium DAO. So I, I got two questions, um, one for Indigo and um, another anyone can take it up. Uh, yeah, uh, the Indigo one is um, the uh, governance infrastructure you're building. Are you going to make it available for projects that want to use the infrastructure or is it just native to the Indigo protocol? Then um, the second question is, um, uh, you know, we pretty much know about the DAO hacks that are happening in other blockchains. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just want to know what are the vulnerabilities and the negativities of um, multi-sig wallets in, on Cardano. Um, and I don't know if uh, SundaySwap, the infrastructure you're building, are you also going to provide uh, multi-sigs? I know uh, Tom, from ADA, you know, you are providing that, but, uh, you know, uh, I would like to hear your inputs on the vulnerabilities and the negativities of, you know, controlling funds in multi-sig wallets. Uh, I'll answer your question really quickly about whether or not we're going to allow for kind of white labeling of our governance system. Currently, it's not on our agenda. It's kind of our whole plan. Uh, it, it has been presented before from other folks that we've shown this governance system to as to the idea of whether or not we would consider that. Um, I would say our governance system is really customized and tailor, tailored to Indigo's needs specifically, though um, if our friends at Sunday or whomever else really kind of saw value and benefit in it after it's battle tested to Pi's earlier point, then I, I think we could consider something like that. But right now to answer your question, you know, just for this current time, it hasn't um, we haven't prioritized that. Yeah, and then just to kind of expand on that, so for those who don't know, um, the way that multi-sigs work on Cardano is essentially just a list of normal wallets that have to sign it. And so the, um, the security of multi-sigs on Cardano and the native scripts that I think it was Tom um, was referring to is as secure, um, mod some small details, but as secure as the signatures that you provide for your wallet. So if that gets broken, uh, you know, all funds on Cardano and all wallets on Cardano uh, and much of the cryptography that the internet is built off of, you know, is at risk. Um, the, the kind of asterisk details that I, I referenced is the, the logic for combining those, for saying, yeah, we need five out of seven of these signatures. But you can imagine that like it's a simple counting problem, right? Count that I have five out of these seven signatures. So like Tom was saying, the surface area for what could possibly go wrong is much smaller than, for example, implementing that logic uh, or a dynamic multi-sig where membership can change over time and, and things like that, that... Uh, projects over on Solidity are using today and where you see lots of those hacks. Um, so yeah, that's a, uh, a really great question and a really great thing to be thinking about. Um, and from a multi-sig perspective, you know, it, it is as secure as uh, any Cardano wallet and as secure as you um, secure those keys, uh, you know, use hardware wallets or paper wallets or, you know, uh, whatever system you use to um, maintain the security of your private keys. Um, so hopefully that answers a little bit of your question. Fantastic, Pai. Thank you very much. Um, 
So I think uh, we don't have any more requests. Uh, good time to perhaps wrap it up. And I'd just like to thank um, uh, uh, my co-host, um, Cardano with Paul, who's gone now for um, carrying out the discussion. I'd like to thank every one of the projects here, Sunday Swap, Drip Drops, Indigo, and Eta BTC. I'd like to also thank all the contributors in terms of guest speakers from the audience and all the people who are listening. So we'll say good evening. Thank you very much.